Hmm. Okay. Well. Well, thank you. Thank you, Liz, for inviting me here. Thanks, you all, for coming. I'm going to uh, focus uh, predominantly on how I think we have to change our way of thinking and then try to move to uh, some what I think are best practices for, for that uh, new way of thinking. Um, it's no secret that cinema has been a driving force in my life. You know, I don't want it to leave us, and nor do I want to leave it behind. It's provided me with hope and inspiration and a you know, pretty exciting livelihood, very fulfilling one. It's also close to a 100-year-old industry, and in my opinion, you know, pretty damn close to a perfect art form and a, a perfect entertainment. But it's also one that I feel whose applicability to our lives and livelihoods have to be completely reevaluated. And I think you do too, because that's why we're here, right? You know, cinema in its current concept and execution is both derived from and, and depending upon a world that I feel has already passed us by, or we've already passed by. It's no longer the complete and representative art form for the world that we inhabit. It's, it no longer currently uh, mirrors the world we live in. I feel it's kind of a, frankly, a, a rarefied pleasure requiring us to confirm to a location-centric abbreviated passive experience that is nothing like the world that we inhabit uh, day to day. We also have to recognize that there is no workable present day business model to support this current mode of cinema other than one that's built on exclusionary practices of isolated control of funding, marketing, distribution, exhibition systems. We know that the, those models, particularly for financing and distribution, um, but also by extension creation, are kind of running on fumes these days. I mean, how long can the controlling studio model survive when the wall of control has already come down and the people embra now embracing the fact that they're both audiences and creators have recognized that the power they truly have and will unlikely ever surrender that again? How long can a business model that's based on library assets survive when everything has already been digitized and copied and can be spread with a quick touch of a button and every time it's stopped can only can quickly reappear someone else again, somewhere else again. Now, you know, surely th these are big problems for us, but, you know, being here today joining in this conversation is truly exciting for me because I feel like we are here to define and to develop a, a new art form, one that can also truly spawn a new business model. I feel it can be done, it, it will be done, and whether we call it cross-media, cross-platform, transmedia, or just good old plain cinema, I'm confident we're going to do it. But in rebuilding our representative art form to truly demonstrate the world we truly live in now, we, we will also develop a business model specifically for it, and I'm confident it will be one that's founded on access and transparency, and one that rewards the work rendered and not the control that is maintained. I felt, you know, I think this is a hope that's brought us all here together and one that will move us forward. But we not only uh, all now get to participate in this reinvention of cinema, we all have to participate in it. Things have truly changed. You know, previously creators couldn't or perhaps wouldn't truly participate in the, the whole of cinema. And that's uh, what I first want to talk about. If, if we as creators redefine cinema a, as a complete whole, if we take back that which has already been, uh, always have been ours, cinema will no longer be the same art form that it was 100 years ago. Nor will it have the same film industry that, nor will we have the same film industry that we have today. But I think to think forward, we also kind of have to look backwards to see what, uh, how we got in this part uh, into this way of naming cinema as a representative just of the part of the process, not the whole. Because it's not just the narrative component. You know, cinema is the entire process. It's the dialogue that goes on between the audience and the content. It's the experience that resonates long after the lights have gone on. And if we address that as creators, I think things start to change in a big way. 
I've, I've felt that cinema, I know I said before five pillars, but I think that cinema is supported by, by six pillars. And as creators, we've only been asked to participate in two of them, content and production. You know, content is, you know, made up of the sound, the image, time, passage, narrative. Um, and it's had more than enough for any singular author to content themselves with. You know, production, up until, say, like 20 years ago, generally meant that creators had to go work for somebody else because the cost of production was too excessive. We weren't really able to ever afford it on our own. But that, economical, that economic barrier to personally produce what we conceive has now, frankly, virtually disappeared. But still, for the last two decades, independent filmmakers mistakenly perceived it as some sort of victory that we had the opportunity to participate in just these first two pillars. But in setting our dominion as just you know, these two, we haven't really seen the forest for the trees. If we look at what the great woods are that surround us now, we should recognize not just the possibility, but again, the necessity to engage in the other four pillars, which I define as discovery, promotion, participation, and presentation. We have to embrace this opportunity to engage in these aspects, or frankly, we will, we will lose it. Those who are in control of the financing and distribution apparatus have historically limited the creative team's full involvement to only the first two of content and production. You know, for if they grant the direct access to the consumer, to the audience, to the fan, they also reduce their own control of the gate, of the choices, and the, the rewards, predominantly financial. With, with our new access and involvement, that power to, to create, to access, to spread, and to appreciate is going to be owned by each and every one of us. Yet, in denying the creative class access to the, those last four pillars of cinema, our industry is also inhibited the narrative form from expanding beyond a linear structure and its delivery from my get grading from a single platform. Yet, and I don't fully understand why, the creative side has somehow readily accepted this. Also even propagated the myth that, that it's how it's supposed to be. For these first hundred years of cinema, we've embraced a very short-sighted vision of what cinema and its creation and appreciation is. When, when considering the audience's actual experience of cinema, we, 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 the creative class, has embraced a false and unnecessary demarcation between commerce and art, between content and marketing, between the creator and the audience. Marketing and narrative both influence each other. They each can be used to shape our perception and, and knowledge of the events that we intend to consume. I mean, isn't d discovery the first point of the narrative process? Isn't promotion about that point of impact where the audience, uh, for the, uh, the audience's discovery and its subsequent resonance? Cinema and its business structure changes with our acceptance of this greater definition of our work. The cell is part of the creation. We enter our stories by the path that the, the, the piper of marketing paves in front of us. We react not just by our own instincts, but also in accordance with what is happening all around us, what our contemporaries are also experiencing. If we stop being cynical about the marketing aspects and use them instead to shape our narratives, to, to make sure that the narrative also, also shapes those points of impact that we call marketing, our stories will have more influence and depth, resonance, by just the sheer fact that they are now more complete and carried from that moment of discovery and reinforced through the moments of resonance and then later represented by the objects that we choose to surround ourselves with. By shredding this false construct of a line between the form and its delivery, we do transform the art form. By extending the narrative in the direction of what was once called marketing or business, 
cinema itself is no longer just a line. It's a, it's a, it's a sphere, a full world, and not just a slice of life. By removing the constrictions of where and when we encounter cinema, it becomes a much greater influence on our lives. And by spreading the opportunities we have to engage both back and forth across multiple platforms, cinema is no longer an impulsive, location-centric activity, but an ever-present and consistent choice in our lives. And by changing from a monologue to a dialogue with our audiences, we return the ownership back to the commons and gain back a loyalty in exchange. As storytellers, we've been trained to think predominantly in the form of the feature length narrative. It's a byproduct of that tunnel vision and our acceptance of a limited definition of cinema restricted to the singular aspects of something that's a far more rich communal experience. For our art form and our business to both reflect the realities of the world we're living in, we have to embrace a new set of best practices for, for, the, for the narrative form, solutions that attract new audiences and experiments that can lead to new business models. We have to e erase the, this division between content and marketing, between commerce and art, between creation, presentation, and appreciation. As creators, entrepreneurs and audiences, we have to leap into the whole of cinema, abandon the trees, and enter these forests. I, I don't have an answer yet, but I suspect that the list that we all need to embrace will include aspects of all six of these pillars of cinema, and not just the two we've always aligned ourselves with. It, in these days ahead, I, the best practices for engagement in these six pillars, I think, are going to become a lot clearer. But, but some things, I think, are already pretty evident. And now, by no means do I, I'm going to attempt to give you a comprehensive list. But I do think that if all my future collaborators entered my office um, considering some of the things I'm going to suggest now, the solutions to some of the struggles that face our industry currently will feel a lot more evident. So that's what I I'm going to attempt to do is go through the, these six pillars and talk about some of the, the practices I think we can all engage in to help find this new form in business. So in regard to content and its creation, the, the, the first thing I ask you know, the filmmakers I work with now is to expand the narrative along a common thematic premise from not just a, a feature format but also to include numerous short form works that can be used to seed, corral, and bridge audiences from one work to the next, to change from a one-off way of working to an ongoing conversation. We need to also create story world instructions that will allow others to also enter and participate in the narrative. A guide that will describe the rules which can be followed in the creation of characters and their actions. We have to open up our narrative and erase the end, or at least rather, you know, give multiple opportunities for endings, as audiences want to be able to re-engage in new and different ways at different times. We have to open up our narrative and off offer alternative points of view so that the experience is no longer a single character-centric experience. We have to consider the opportunities we have for offline discussions and individual customization to re-enter and even influence the narrative. You know, should, should, should characters, in addition to the audiences, be able to comment on the choices the creators make? You know, where can user-generated modifi user modifications enter the narrative later on in the process? You know, beyond just even story and character, can audience-generated image overlays play some sort of role in the experience? We have to shed the notion that, that it's distancing for audiences to have characters played by different actors, have the same characters played by different actors. You know, as the great works of both Shakespeare and Doctor Who, I think, have demonstrated, you know, we can drive a lot of pleasure from witnessing, different, uh, di uh, witnessing a role rendered by different performers. And frankly, this can even be done effectively within the, f the framework of a single narrative. 
a single work. We have to find ways that in the creation of our material we can embrace collaboration. You know, there's so much work to be done. When I look at what all of our job descriptions are now, it's inconceivable that a single author can build an entire world. You know, where can the crowd provide material in an organic way that will en enhance their relationship to the central work? I also fi find it uh, very restrictive along the way that many people get, get so focused on what their original intent is. I encourage folks to, to think just plain wildly at times, you know, have collaborative brainstorming sessions with other like-minded storytellers on how to expand the narrative. You know, is there a way that, that multiple people could collaborate around this idea? You know, um, are, are the supporting characters worthy of their own stories, their own experiences, and their own environments? Could, could alternate futures and alternate paths be sketched out now? Those are like some of the things along the content and the creation of, of content that I, practices that I think can help us. In production, it just makes common sense to me now that we would record the, the data and provide access to it every step of the way, that we would show our fans how our work is being done, well, that we would pull back the curtain and let others see the mystery, record the recording thereof, you know, let our crew and cast really broadcast and comment on the process, and recognize that those folks, our crew, our cast, our vendors, are our work's initial community. We have to bring them into the discussion and provide opportunity. In terms of the discovery process, the discovery pillar, we can provide many more point, points um, across many more platforms for, for such discovery by the audiences. You know, whether they come from websites and blogs or video content or games, trailers, clips, or posters, you know, those are the most traditional way, but they're, they're arenas that still have much more room for, for expansion and innovation. You know, those introduction mechanisms can be used not just in terms of speaking about the whole work, but they can also speak about the process, uh, about steps along the narrative. They can become, you know, I'm still waiting to see the trailers for different chapter headings of longer works, posters that represent the creative process from the initial conception to the final completion. I want to see how these things are dramatized through, through their images. We can provide our audience with, with a, a more proper context for appreciation. And I think this usually comes from, from us as creators also embracing a curatorial role, providing that service to help the audience understand how the work we're now working fits in the entertainment and cultural chains. So, you know, the referral works. If you like X, then you'll also like Y. You know, we need to provide cultural reference points for a comparison from the very beginning. You know, it's our job as creators to recognize that it's also our job to curate and demonstrate those other works that we love. We have to consistently uh, be brainstorming participatory opportunities. You know, wh what are the gaming structures inherent to the narrative? I, I had somebody uh, speak to me recently about how uh, there are several uh, competing companies right now creating the, the same sort of uh, gaming templates uh, for the industry that blogger or WordPress uh, represent as blogging templates. You know, uh, things that, that will um, allow you to adapt rudimentary structures to your work or um, provide attributes of your characters into a larger gaming uh, environment. So those questions of, you know, what are the missions and obstacles that your characters face and how they can be mirrored in a gaming environment are important questions to ask in the development process. You know, w whether your players can interact in a gaming world via the appropriation of the character traits that your story originates. In regards... Oh, whoa, that computer almost went. <laughs> quick. I may stumble, but I'm quick to pick myself up. Um, in regards to the, the, the pillar of participation, we have to provide multiple areas of participation on a casual level. You know, just really from the very beginning, ask ourselves, you know, what are the aspects of the story 
that would be fun. That would be a fun application or widget that would be spreadable and engaged in. I was uh, thrilled um, that, uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed that this, but uh, um, there's a new game for, for Daniel Johnston, who's a singer and songwriter, a uh, manic depressive schizophrenic singer songwriter that I got to help make a movie about called The Devil and Daniel Johnston. And there's now a fantastic game that my nine-year-old son says is the best game ever for the iPhone called Hi, How Are You? that takes Daniel's frog characters and his music and lets you move them through. You know, um, I envision, you know, an entire class of fourth graders, you know, all knowing who Daniel Johnston is through the, uh, you know, the playing of this game. That would be a better world in my, play, in my mind. Walking the cow. Um, you know, that, you know, that does... You know the the story development or, or trivia, trivia or gaming, you know, warrant some sort of prizes or contests or, or cookie uh, along the way that you can help reward people for their participation. You know that we have to offer many different points of access for the audience uh, for audience participation on a creative story level. You know we have to design characters that can easily travel into other creators' hands. We have to embrace. Um, iconic costumes or behavior that alleviate the, the need for for um, what was that word for for a specific actor identification and and thus in, increase spreadability. We have to utilize totemic props and dressing and design to allow the story environments to permeate the boundaries of our real world as fans appropriate such objects and display them in their worlds. We have to provide the fans the same opportunity to create on the same lines as the story's originators. We have to allow for that remixing and reposting. You know, alternative POVs and approaches to the material, I think, make for a much richer experience for the hardcore fan. We should examine how our narratives might encourage fan fiction. You know, because, you know, isn't it what we all really want? Um, that, that the, 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 the user, you know, becomes the creator who thus becomes a promoter for our work. We should accept the fact that audiences like to be both directed to and to participate. You know, that, that both the truly active and the somewhat passive experiences are pleasurable. And we should demonstrate to the audiences how they can participate more with and in our stories that instead of defining ourselves as creators, we should really accept ourselves as enablers. In regards to promotion, we need to really offer different points of access for audience participation on a fan and appreciation level. You know, as I mentioned, we should let them in on the details of the how and why, where it was shot, when it was shot, um, embed the, the, that, the, those coordinates into all the information and data that we create. I give full credit to Lance for, for encouraging me that, that along the way. You know, what, what, what themes w within our narrative allow for, for the aggregation, um, allow for aggregation on a single subject website? That, that kind of idea of like, well, you know, if only there was a man who could dot, 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 or, you know, the worst day of my life, the worst day of my life at my worst job was when blah, 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 that these sort of places where people can use the stories that we create to, re to reimagine their own lives or, or provide those details of their own lives are kind of key, I think, to, to how people will eventually find and enter stories. Well, I think perhaps most importantly, we have to provide much greater insight into the process, allow our audiences to get to know the creators, bring them on an equal basis, you know, build... Um, fans and build a fan base of essentially fans of friends and family. I think most people who have uh, created works have had that experience where you do an initial screening for your friends and family and you know your work still frankly stinks but you screen it for them and they think it smells like roses. They know what your experience has been in generating this project. They're predisposed to, to embrace it warmly. Yet by limiting, by putting that wall up, 
in that way of I'm the creator and you're the audience, we limit who can really be that receptive audience. We should offer and reward fans the opportunities to create and thus, you know, aggregate different promotional tools. We should find ways to encourage them to, to generate their own posters and their own trailers, their own fan fiction. We should build referral services into the narrative and engagement processes. And we should provide individual curators with unique opportunities and rewards throughout the process. In regards to presentation, I, I think that we, we have to make presentation, i.e. exhibition, an event again, you know, not just put on, just not present movies, but really put on a show, add some sort of live and engaged social component. And part of that, it's critical again to know who your fans are in advance. But it's the goal is to bring back that kind of once in a lifetime event that all the multiple platforms have somehow uh, started to to erase. We need to also, in presentation, provide a much deeper. Um, opportunity, a much greater opportunity for deeper appreciation. We should be furnishing study notes. We should be moderating discussions that allow the content to more fully resonate with audiences. When we think about platforms, we have to think about that platform of the live event and how it can be used more effectively. And we have to work to keep our experiences alive much longer than, than just a period of when the work has ended. We, should, we need to offer our fans the totemic objects. You know, some may call it merchandising, some may call it fetish objects, but whatever it is, we've really restricted ourselves to a single product. And as filmmakers, as creators, we can expand that quite a bit. We need to give fans an opportunity to demonstrate their passion back to us. Now, I can't say that if I got this organization and presentation right in terms of the six pillars and all of the things you need to do. And I certainly know that that list that I just went through is nowhere near complete. I don't believe there's any sort of template for creation or template for production, um, or nor for any of the, those six pillars I went through. Yet, there may be no template, but I really do believe that there are a series of best practices. And I hope that I've given some fuel to the thought of what those may be. For in taking control of what has always been ours, those six pillars of, production, of, of cinema, by embracing its whole and not just a single part, we, both, both the original creators and the engaged audiences, expand the potential for narrative, for cinema overall, and for its appreciation. That's the, the mission we all have before us. It's our mandate, and it's why I was excited to come here and get an opportunity to talk to all of you and hopefully continue it in the days ahead. Um, it's a great opportunity, and I hope we all get to take advantage of it. So thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm told we have uh, ten, ten minutes or so for, for uh, questions, so... If you have any, right, right there in the center. Um, I think we have a microphone. Yeah, I've got Do two mics, yeah. one on either side. Now, did I avoid dancing on my feet this time? I, I, I tried to kind of get. Hi some. there. Um, can you just list for me? Sorry, I was too slow in writing it down. It's too early in the morning for me. Um, your six pillars, because I've got four of them. There. <laughs> Thank you. Content and production being the, the, the two that we've always been uh, offered the opportunity to engage in. Discovery, pr promotion. Uh, <laughs> where, where were they now? You make, you, where'd they go? I've got to get it right. Uh, participation and presentation. I like that alliteration, but I, it's hard to... I haven't figured out the one that begins with a P for discovery, but... Discovery, promotion, participation, presentation, production, and, and uh, content. Thank you very much. Over there? On the, on the aisle? I've, I've got a quickie over here. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I've got the microphone, okay, so I've got the sorry. chair. Over here, okay. over here, over here. Okay. I was very interested in what you say about um, the need for making exhibition more, of an, ev more of, of an event. And I just wondered if you felt we had the exhibition sector capable of delivering that or whether we need to reskill 
an exhibition sex which has become a popcorn shop? Um, I, I, I'm excited to, to watch cinema uh, remove, remove itself from just the traditional venues. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, things that are going on throughout the world where, where people have been screening in alternative spaces. I don't f- know a great deal about the, the exhibition and distribution industry here in the UK, but I, I have had the opportunity to uh, speak before the independent cinema owners in the States, and they spoke to me about their, their interest in trying to break free of the, the, a, a single film on a single screen for an extended length of time and to open up that, that, that change. Many of them have been outfitted in, uh, with digital cinemas, not always DCI compliant, but with, with, with the ability uh, to, to receive and uh, project digitally. Um, and they could be free. They could start screening, you know, for seniors at 4 p.m. and for religious groups on Sunday and so forth and so on. But they, they tell me that frequently, because they are so dependent on getting the, the, the hit film for their livelihood, the, ex, the distributors dictate that they maintain this, this, this practice. And even when there's a kind of a wink and a nod, i.e., uh, we'll give you 25% of the gate on Monday night, even though we won't be screening your film and we'll be screening something independently, they run into a lot of opposition when it gets publicized. They, they told me that uh, even if like one distributor sa- sa- says okay to them, once they do it, the bigger chains in the States then call up that distributor and say, why are you allowing mom and pop down the road to screen whatever they want on Monday night? Um, you know, that, that feels to me like a very difficult process to, to break, um, although I've heard tales of much success. Um, I'm told that the, uh, I think the third highest grossing theater in a per capita in the States is Michael Moore's uh, cinema in Traverse City, which is a you know, resort community, but in an isolated place. But he gave Monday nights to his community, um, as I understand it, that on the first Monday of the month, it's for the Democrats, and the second Monday of the month, it's for the Republicans. Third Monday alternates between seniors and juniors, uh, seniors and youth, and the fourth is for all the different religious groups on a rotating basis, and it's free. And the popcorn's only 25 cents, and the ushers all wear uniforms, and if you break out a cell phone, you're banned for life, and your photo is posted on the wall. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, as a result, people feel the, the cinema is their community center, and they come and they, they go. Um, but I, I think it's a, it's a challenge to, to kind of start to reinvent um, you know, what, what the exhibition process is in, in uh, traditional theaters. But um, there is a huge rise in uh, cinema clubs in, in the, the states. You know, um, they, they're, uh, you see them migrating to the rooftops and the, the, the bars. Um, and, and with that, the opportunity to do different things. Everybody gets excited about the, our ability to you know, distribute freely and widely on the Internet. But I also long for the day when certain things could only be seen you know, one time only. And if you didn't make it, you lost out. The, the, the uh, first year I moved to New York, um, I was very excited because Robert Frank's Rolling Stone documentary, Cocksucker Blues, was uh, playing for one time only as he was permitted. And I made sure that I got to do that. And I bragged about it and told about it. And you know, now I you know, bought the, the bootleg on the internet, I admit. Um, and and uh, it doesn't quite have the same resonance. You know? but, so that question of how to put on a show and where to put on the show, I think, is a, is a perplexing one, but one that has a lot of different answers. That's a short answer. I think it's perhaps best that I don't pick. You guys just distribute the microphones or else. Thank you. It was great to go back and forth. It was a great lecture. Um, I, uh, filmmakers, uh, uh, feature filmmakers traditionally have spent many years obsessing about um, their 90 minute story and they're developing this tiny little gem. Um, and they release it, and it's their their precious treasure. Um, it, as you said, it's inconceivable for one person to, you know, uh, can, to, to create a whole world. W- what you're talking about is uh, 
a creative uh, central figure who's more like a, a CEO of a sort of vertically and horizontally integrated manufacturing business it, more than traditionally somebody who's been focused on one story that they're trying to hone down to this 90 minutes. And I just, it seems to me that it's a whole different skill set and a whole different mindset for people who have traditionally been in love with the idea of telling one story in a feature film format that, um, that a lot of people are going to be resistant to who are traditionally feature filmmakers. And is cinema and feature film the best format for transmedia, for, for, for kind of getting stuff off the ground with, with transmedia and interactive stories? I, I don't think that feature films are the, the best format for uh, cross-platform transmedia, but I think it's the way our brains are currently wired to, to think first, and it's going to be a, a long road before the uh, stories really develop organically. You know, maybe two or three years, but it's still... I've got to figure out a way to support myself in the, in the interim. But, um, you know, I, I think we've witnessed through, through culture how stories uh, benefit from uh, adaptation and reimagining, whether it's taking a, a theater piece and bringing it to the screen or a traditional folk tale of how it changes as it's passed uh, along the, the way. You know, I've, I've made a, about 60 films, and I would say of those that have been produced, because there's certainly a lot more scripts that have been developed, um, maybe five or six of them really were the work of a single author. Now, I've only made one film that had uh, multiple, uh, I believe, multiple credits on it. But when I say that, you know, I think you can also look at the works that I've been involved with and see, see some common threads and some common themes, even some common lines of dialogue. Uh, and you start to recognize that there's more than one person who, who's working along the way. Um, that, you know, it, it's more work uh, than often one person can do that I, I found that in producing work, it's that back and forth of, of collaboration, of talking about the possibilities that each character, each interaction, you know, each story holds. And uh, there's many good works that, that we have to put on the side in kind of refining it to that 90-minute uh, range. So I, I, I feel that, that in the development of feature films, it's natural to actually have a much more content than we know what to do with. And we have to kind of start to find the framework of it. But we frequently just throw those pages out or throw that version um, to the side because of our restriction of, of 90 minutes. So the, I think the opportunities to create th this much greater world are frankly thrilling. This side, right? What, last question? And, it, and I, have to, I have to answer quickly. A yes or no? Okay, quick question. Um, you mentioned the need to create more live events or a feeling of sort of live experience for theatre distribution and so forth. Um, in the UK, and I'm guessing the same in the States, there's been a lot of experimentation with using satellite relays and opera companies and theatre companies doing live events that are streamed and distributed around different theatres. I wondered if you had had any experience of that yourself and what your thoughts were as to how that might help to create a live mix perhaps with pre-recorded media. Um, I haven't engaged in that process myself, but I, I have uh, spoke to, spoken to um, fo folks that control those mechanisms about how they could be utilized, and I've certainly spoken to creators who, who get very excited about uh, the, the customized uh, film, the film that might have source material from London and source material from New York and source material from Tokyo, and it's those versions that are screened simultaneously, you know, uh, in some way. Um, so people have the, the opportunity to interact and discuss the differences of their experiences. I've been to live events that manipulated what one side of the room saw versus what another room, side of the room saw and saw how that created an, another work and a, a process of engagement. And I think that's really, truly exciting. But uh, the fact that I haven't got, gotten to experience that yet um, is, you know, ke keeps me awake thinking at night, you know, that there's so much to do. It's, it's exciting, you know. So I look forward to one of you guys doing it. Uh, 
Thank you. I, and uh, I'll see you later in these next few days.